Okay, could somebody please um, pray with us together as a class and then we will uh, uh, get started. Um, would be nice, would you like to pray? Yeah, sure, Pastor. Yeah, thank you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful time and the morning and this new life, Father God, that you have given us, Lord Jesus. This morning, Lord, we choose to praise you, Master. We choose to worship you, God, for everything that you are doing and you are going to do in our life, Father God. Thank you, Father God. We submit this day and this time into your mighty hand, Father God, as we are, Lord Jesus, going to Going through this session, Father God, we ask you more of your revelation and wisdom, Father God, and we submit Pastor Asis into your mighty hand, Lord Jesus, and all the fellows that we are here, Lord Jesus. We give you all the praise and honor, Lord Jesus, and we ask this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Welcome, uh, everyone, once again to this class. Um, this is our second lecture this week, and um, um, in this course on holiness. And we are uh, uh, close to completing the second section, which is on repentance, uh, recovery, and restoration. Um, so um, I'm going to just pick up um, uh, from where we left on the class on Monday. I just quickly review a few uh, of the uh, uh, points that we spoke about and then uh, go forward and I hope uh, we can finish this section uh, in the lecture today. I'm going to share the PDF. All right. So we were talking about the process of repentance. So what we said uh, in our previous lecture was sometimes uh, repentance is just uh, uh, um, you know a very short, simple uh, step that we take when we realize we've done something wrong out of alignment with God and we change our thinking and we change our act action and we just turn back to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry about that and forgive me, cleanse me, and uh, you know, I change my thinking about that. I come into alignment with the Word of God. Sometimes it's as simple as that. But sometimes uh, the matter can be very serious in the sense that uh, it's just not a momentary deviation or a, a, a deviation from what God wants, but it's a slow drift away from what God wants. So a person, a believer, may have slowly drifted away, right? So it's not just one step out of alignment, but it's a journey that's taken them far away from, you know, what God wants for their lives. And uh, in such cases, uh, you know, repentance can be a process. I mean, it's, it's, uh, they need to repent and they need to make the journey of recovery and see restoration in their lives. So we must give room for that in our uh, understanding and also in our journey, spiritual journey. That is, uh, there may be times in our personal lives or when we are serving other people, ministering to other people, that we may need to lead them. Uh, through this whole journey, this whole process of repentance. And we made mention of uh, the prodigal son. You know, he was fine at home. Everything was going good. Then he just decided one day he wants to make a journey. <laughs> and he took all the thing, all his possessions and he made his journey. And he went far, far, far away from his father's house. And until he, his whole life was in a mess. And when he hit, you know, like we say, rock bottom, he came to his senses. And that's when his thinking changed. And even though his thinking changed, which is, which is the first step in repentance, he had to make the journey of recovery. That means he had to journey back home and then, you know, acknowledge uh, his wrong. And uh, then there was restoration. 
And we saw this example also in 2 Corinthians 7 when Paul is dealing with the church in Corinth, you know, how he corrects them. And we kind of broke down this passage just to outline, you know, these three uh, important stages in this process of repentance. Uh, we said that uh, during repentance, when a person is repenting, you know, we would see these kinds of um, things that there has to be diligence. I mean, it's, it's got to be a serious thing. There's got to be a clearing of ourselves, uh, an eagerness to do what's right. Uh, there's got to be wrath or displeasure against sin. And uh, there's got to be a degree of shock about, you know, hey, what has happened? Where I am? This is not where I'm supposed to be. This should not have happened. Something is wrong, right? So there, there should be that sense of fear and also a vehement desire, um, a longing for the holiness of God and seriousness of purpose. And then in the, in the process of recovery, there's got to be passion for God that's rekindled and revived and renewed. Um, and there's also a vindication that is, look, I need whatever's wrong, I need to deal with it. I need to punish wrongdoing. I need to bring things out in, in a place where I write what is wrong. And then uh, a place of restoration. And I prove myself clear. That means uh, there has to be a, a time when I show that, uh, you know, the, my repentance is genuine. I prove myself to be clear. And that's when restoration takes place um, in a person's life. So we went up to that. And I just want to go forward here. Now, I've mentioned this earlier under holiness, uh, uh, towards the end of that first section of holiness, but I want to put it here again, uh, which is, uh, you know, practically, what would a repentant and restored lifestyle look like? Um, now, you know, these are practical matters, right? So if a person has truly gone through the process of repentance, recovery, and restoration, what should we see in his life? And what, what, sh what should be taking place in such a person's life? It could be us, our, our, our own selves, as well as other people that we are ministering to. Well, uh, we, there has to be a commitment to live with reverence toward God always, right? So uh, when, when we've made this journey of repentance, recovery, and restoration, there's got to be a commitment. I'm going to live with reverence toward God. Now, all that I'm saying, all that we see here, of course, applies to even those you know who may not have drift, drifted away, right? Uh, this is something we all have to practice, uh, but I'm putting this uh, in the context of, let's say a person has gone through this whole journey of repentance, recovery, and restoration. Uh, what should we emphasize? Right? What should we look for? One is that there's a commitment to live with reverence toward God, you know, um, a, a holy fear of God. So that has to be there. Secondly, there has to be vigilance on all sides. That means uh, the person is watchful, you know, uh, what were the things that caused him to drift away in the first place? You know, what were the things that he was slack about, that he was not careful about the first time? Um, uh, so that that just allowed him to drift away from the will of God in his life. He's got to live with vigilance. He's got to be careful of those areas now. You know, if it has to do uh, with certain addictive addictions or certain kinds of relationships or certain areas of weaknesses, there has to be vigilance. That means he's got to be vigilant, alert in those areas and not unnecessarily expose himself uh, to those areas. So there's got to be that. And, and, and that practically, uh, we live by putting boundaries in all matters. And the Apostle Paul said, you know, in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he said, you know, I keep my body in subjection. Uh, lest when I have preached to others, you know, I, I discipline myself and I keep myself in subjection. Lest when I preach to others, I myself should be disqualified. So uh, there is that sense of self-discipline and um, uh, keeping those boundaries. So, you know, you, you put legitimate boundaries um, in, in, uh, for uh, how you live life. Uh, 
in some practical ways, you know, for example, uh, especially in the, in the area of Christian ministry, uh, you say, okay, you know, uh, I'm not going to uh, get too involved in counseling someone of the opposite gender, right? So, of course, you'll have conversations, you can talk and all of that. But when you're getting into a counseling situation, uh, you don't get too involved. You know, for, for example, even for me as a pastor, if a lady wants to come and meet me, okay, yeah, I might meet them once or twice. But if that person, if that lady needs a lot, you know, a serious help, a lot of counseling work, I would immediately after my first or two, you know, meetings and discussion to understand what the situation is, uh, I would say, okay, you know, you need to go meet uh, one of our women counselors. You know, I don't get into a personal counseling situation with somebody of the opposite gender. So that's a legitimate boundary, you know, so, or you never travel alone with somebody of the opposite gender. So if, even if you're going on ministry work, anything, you never travel alone. That's a boundary. You never do it. You know, you always go as a group or as a team. Um, and uh, so that there are lots of, there are, you know, people around and all, all the time. So uh, these are legitimate boundaries um, that, uh, that, that you keep for yourself, you know. So uh, uh, practically, you got to have uh, boundaries. You know, same thing in the handling of finances, um, church ministry finance, okay. Uh, you know, the other other people will handle it. Sure, um, uh, I may be, give approvals, I may approve things, but finances are being handled by others, not by me. Um, uh, things like that. You know, there are legitimate boundaries uh, in all matters, uh, so that we make sure that we don't make, we don't fall, we don't make mistakes, that we don't drift away uh, in these things. Right. So I've just given you some examples uh, of uh, living with boundaries in all matters. Um, for example, um, yeah, so when you're traveling, when you're traveling, you, you try to travel as a team, or if it necessitates that you travel alone, and sometimes I do travel alone because it's not, you know, worth, uh, you know, taking a team, it's just maybe a small engagement, okay, then again over there, I'm very careful, okay, if I'm staying in a hotel, uh, I, I don't let anybody come into my room, if I have to meet people, I will meet them separately. If if somebody wants to meet my room, it's only going to be another man. And, uh, you know, that's also, you're very careful. Right? So uh, otherwise you meet in a public place where everybody can see uh, you're meeting and discussing and so on, things like that. Or you're going to meet as a group, things like that. So uh, these are all boundaries, practical boundaries you put uh, so that, you don't want to let things happen, wrong things happen, right? So there has to be those things in the life of a person, especially, you know, once there has been repentance, recovery, restoration, got to live with these boundaries in all matters. Um, also, you live with transparency before others who matter to you. you know, example, with your own spouse, with your ministry team, with your uh, pastors and so on. That means uh, they need to... Uh, be able to, you know, see your life at any time. I'm not saying, you know, everybody's going to check everything. Obviously, people are not going to be checking your phone or your laptop or your, you know, what you're doing, everything. But there is that openness. Uh, there's that sense of transparency that uh, anyone could possibly check. It's not that they are going to keep coming and checking, but it is open for anyone to do it. Example. Uh, on my phone, uh, you know, I don't have any security lock. It's always open because uh, anyone can take up my phone. So uh, in the office, um, my, some of our team people may use my phone, you know, uh, for some work-related matters. So I just give my phone. So, you know, so it's open. So they will come and pick up my phone and they will use, especially the accounting people, they come, they'll use my phone. So there's no lock on my phone. Uh, they can see if they, if they want to, they can read any of my messages at any time. Uh, or on my phone at home, uh, there's no lock on it. My wife can, you know, take my phone anytime, uh, see it. Not that she does it, 
but there's no need to do it. It's, it's completely open. Uh, same thing for my laptop. Uh, everyone in my family, my wife and my children know my password. There's nothing hidden, you know. Uh, if they want to, they can log in and they can see anything on my laptop. There's there's nothing that I need to hide. Uh, so uh, it's not that they do it. It's not that they would log in and actually check. They know they don't need to. There is that trust, of course. But the point is they can if they want to. And uh, there is nothing hidden anywhere. So there's that level of transparency, you know, uh, that uh, anyone... Uh, there's nothing being covered up or hidden anywhere and uh, people can see, they can check if they want to. Uh, there's openness. Uh, of course, I'm not going to sit down and talk everything to everybody. We don't have time for that. Uh, but uh, there is that trust and there is that openness. Um, and so you live with transparency uh, with people who matter uh, in your life. right? Um, and then, of course, uh, there, there has to be living with humility. Uh, and humility is expressed by your willingness to be accountable, right? The moment I say I'm above the law, that's a sign of arrogance. That's a sign of pride. In other words, if I have the attitude, well, you have to, you have to obey the rules. I don't. That's a problem. Humility says we all obey the same rules. You know, so, uh, for example, in our, in our workplace as a Christian, as a church organization, we all follow the same rules. Um, uh, you know, we have about, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's something like we have about 30 staff and uh, maybe about 35 consultants who are working. And then plus we have uh, uh, a, a, another group of, uh, you know, 10 translators or some, something like that. Uh, you know, I forget, I don't know the exact numbers. But all our staff and all our consultants all fill up timesheets, including me, right? So we all report our weekly work hours. So starting from the senior pastor to every person in the organization, all the full-time staff, all the consultants, we all report our daily work hours in the same HR portal in our timesheet. We all follow the same process, you know, to um, apply for leaves, um, you, know, you know, whatever vacation. I mean, uh, consultants don't have that, but staff, you know, uh, if you have want to apply for a vacation or whatever, you know, you all follow the same process. So the rules apply to everybody, including the senior pastor. So that means we all live with humility before each other. We all follow the same rules. Um, it's it's an accountability starting from the top on way on the way down. So we have to live with humility. Now some some people may not like that. You know, hey, I'm senior pastor. Why should I follow the rules? Well, you have to. It's a, it's 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 keeping you humble. It's keeping you accountable because if you're part of the organization, the rules apply to every person. Right. So uh, these are uh, some guidance here yeah, for, uh, of course, these are things we follow at all times, but I have put this down, especially as a post-recovery situation. That is, once there has been repentance, recovery, restoration, it's so important to make sure that these things are followed by somebody. Otherwise, they're going to fall back into their old ways. If they don't have these safeguards, you know, if they don't are not committed to a life of reverence, if they're not being vigilant, if they're not living with boundaries, um, if they're not living with uh, transparency, and if they're not living with humility, it's highly likely they're going to go back to their old ways. They're going to fall again, and they're going to drift away uh, from the purpose of God, from the will of God for their lives. So it's so important to put these things in their lives if you're ministering to somebody or in your own life uh, if you've gone through this process of repentance, recovery, and restoration, or better still, to put these things in your, in your life to prevent you from drifting away uh, from 
the will and purpose of God for your life. And so I just wanted to highlight these things here. Now, what about the, you know, just trying to understand the importance of repentance. Um, uh, what if a believer uh, does not uh, repent? You know, so um, suppose a believer he is walking with God. He does wrong things, but he doesn't feel the need. Uh, need he doesn't feel the need to repent, or if his repentance is taken very lightly, he doesn't you know think it's important. What will happen? Hebrews chapter six has a very interesting passage, which I would just like to, us to look at in this context. Uh, could somebody read this for us, please? Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. It's on your screen. Pastor, can I read? Go ahead, please. Hebrews 6, 1 to 6. Therefore, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God of doctrine, of baptism, of laying of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Amen. Mm. Amen. Thank you. Now, think about what the writer is saying in this passage. He's talking about somebody who is well established in the elementary principles of Christ. I mean, they've got it, right? All the basics, they have it. They have the foundation of repentance. They've, they've built, they've started right. You know, they've laid the foundation of repentance uh, from dead works. They have the faith toward God. They've understood all these things, you know, baptism, laying of hands, resurrection. So, They've got their basics right. They've got the foundation right. But somehow in their journey, they fall away. They fall away. You know, they have, they were once enlightened. They had revelation. They tasted the heavenly gift of salvation and all that God gave and the partakers of the Holy Spirit experience the work of the Holy Spirit. They tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. It means, you know, all of the supernatural things. It, you know, so we're having a foretaste of what is to come. So these people have had a wonderful Christian experience, journey. They've got the elementary principles. They've got the foundation right. Um, they've got everything else. They've got everything. And yet, something happens in their lives. We don't know. It could be one of many things. They fall away. Right? So, th think about this. It is very likely that this falling away from this wonderful Christian journey, which they have, of course, doesn't happen uh, in one step. Very rarely, very rarely. But usually the falling away happens as a slow drifting away from the Christian journey. 
they have they have everything going but slowly they begin to drift and they don't even realize it and many times it happens because of a lack of repentance you know so one thing they do something wrong that there is you know there's no genuine repentance they oh, just ignore it keep going oh there is goodness there is grace i just keep going and then again and again and so it's going to be a slow drifting away until they they just become callous or indifferent to all that they actually once experienced and the writer of hebrews is saying it is you know he's using a very strong word it is impossible it is impossible to renew them again to repentance it's very strong they've become so indifferent to these things that they are crucifying again the son of god and putting him to open shame it doesn't mean that they jesus is dying for their sins again it's just that this time they're putting him to shame it's as good as you know uh bringing that same inflicting that same pain to jesus putting him to open shame and they they're not bothered about it that means the heart has become so cold or so hard they don't care that they are actually inflicting pain and shame on the son of god so what i am saying is if we are not if a believer is not living this being in is being watchful to repent and keep short accounts and and stay in this place of continued fellowship with god there's a high possibility of something like this happening of them just drifting away until they reach this place where they are totally indifferent to everything they have once experienced and enjoyed and it leads us into this place of you know self deception and we we just become hard and uh, that's it he says it's impossible to renew them so uh, i i just kind of wrap this section up by saying it's so important for us to be quick to repent to be quick to repent the moment we know something is wrong immediately god i'm sorry and if we remain quick to repent we enjoy the positive outcomes what what did we see we can stay in a place of faith because jesus said repent and believe so uh, it puts us back in a place where we can believe he said repent and see the kingdom of god or receive the kingdom of god so it puts us in a place where we can experience the kingdom of god um it 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 it, it, it you know the work of transformation into christ likeness continues on in our life and we stay in continual fellowship with god and it you know will restore us to where we ought to be and what we ought to enjoy so we need to be in this place of repentance one last thought is uh, sorry i think that two things more yeah um we must also keep in mind uh, collective repentance so while personal repentance is important it's also important to look at the church body as a whole uh, and there are times when as a church body we need to repent collectively or as a community uh, we see examples of that uh, um, uh, in the corinthian church for instance uh, the entire church was uh, was was uh, was you know in division strife and competition Uh, the entire corinthian church was taking sides with people 
you know, so they had cliques, uh, groups, groupisms among them. One would say, I'm of Paul, another would say, I'm of Apollos, and one would say, I'm of Peter. And so they needed to repent of that. Uh, the Corinthian church was, uh, you know, they were puffed up of, on behalf of one man against another. So they were uh, finding their identity in individuals and, you know, uh, uh, you know putting basically uh, competing sort of, you know, against each other. So here are all these problems we see collectively, collective problems that need to be repented of. Or the church in Ephesus, they forgot their first love, Pergamos and Thyatira, uh, they tolerated wrong doctrine. Uh, church in Sardis, they were engaged in perfect works. The church at Laodicea was in self-deception. So these are just examples where uh, uh, there could be a need for collective repentance the community together needs to repent God we have fallen and of course the pastor or the leader in charge should lead that community in repentance when he sees that something is amiss something is wrong you know we collectively have missed the mark then we collectively need to repent uh, get ourselves in a, in a in proper place before God so anytime you see that especially if you're pastoring a church or leading a group of people, and you see like, look, collectively we've missed something, then bring the church collectively to a place of repentance. It could be as simple as just praying together and saying, God, we are sorry for the, for this thing, you know. Uh, but that's important because repentance not only is for at a personal level, but also applies to a collective level. So as a leader, you watch, be careful what is going on. Uh, is everything okay collectively? And if we are remiss, then pray together and bring things back. The last thought that I will share here, and then we will um, take questions is, uh, in Luke 13, uh, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And I understand this is you know, before the cross and before um, being born again and all of that. Uh, but he, you know, he, uh, okay, let's read this passage because it may not be very familiar. Could somebody read this for us, please? Luke 13, one to five. Luke chapter 13, verse 1 to 5. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that there were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Mm, thank you. So, you know, Jesus um, is uh, referencing two incidents that happened, which the, his audience were familiar with. One was about uh, what the Roman ruler Pilate had done to these to a group of Galileans, how he killed them, and uh, you know basically they they were they were they suffered loss of their lives. And so Jesus, you know, why do you think Pilate did it to those people, uh, just to, those those men who suffered? Uh, were they worse than the other men? No. He says not because of that. He says what, what, what he wanted them to, what the people, this audience to understand is unless you repent, you might have the same end. In other words, he's trying to impress upon them, look, you're alive because you have the, so that you could have the opportunity to repent. Same thing. Uh, you know, the Tower of Siloam fell and killed uh, those people. He says, you know, why did those 18 people die? Were they worse than other men? No. They didn't have a chance, but you have a chance. You're alive. And unless you repent, you might end up in that same place. So in other words, he's saying you're alive. You have the opportunity to repent, to turn to God, turn to God. Otherwise, you could end up in that same place. So it's not that people are bad or worse. When we are alive, we need to look at 
the fact that we have life as an opportunity to repent and get right with God. So look at it that way, you know. Uh, so the fact that you're alive, uh, you look at it as, it's not that I'm alive because I'm better than other people, but I'm alive because now God has given me opportunity to repent and you know be in a right place before him. So, uh, you close the section off just by emphasizing the importance of staying in this place of repentance before God, keeping a heart and mind right before God, uh, which is very important in our journey towards holiness. We're going to take uh, use the rest of the time we have today for question answers. And next week, we start the third section, which is overcoming. How do you overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil? Right? So here, these are three things that, that are working against the believer, trying to keep the believer from journeying into holiness in everyday life. The flesh, the world, the influences of the world, and the devil. So how do we battle against that successfully so that we can, you know, perfect holiness practically in our lives? So we start that out next week. Okay, so let's use this time now for questions and question answers. I'll uh, pick up the questions in the chat. Okay. Chaya. Uh, practically, how should we handle repeated offenses? Uh, if a person continues doing wrong, arrogant pride, uh, their arrogance, pride now doesn't change. We pray for them. They repent, but the person is still the same. How should we help and deal with this situation? Um, yeah, how should we help them uh, deal with this? And then, Explain Luke 17, 3 and 4. That's uh, how many times should I forgive my brother, I think. Luke 17, um, 3 and 4. Yeah. All right. So um, if... So there are two sides to it. One is your heart towards that person. So if that person is sinning against you, right, against us, that's Luke 17, 3 and 4, if that person is sinning against me, then Jesus said, I have to forgive 70 times 7. In other words, um, I just keep on forgiving. And it is my responsibility to keep my heart clean towards that person, no matter how many times they they sin against me or offend me. But so that's that's my responsibility. Now, at the same time, of course, practically, uh, if their offense is harming me, then I need to remove myself from harm's way. You know. So example, if that person is speaking against me or very abusive or maybe physically abusive or emotional, hurtful, whatever, I need to keep my heart clean towards that person. I need to love that person, but I need to get myself out of that place. I don't need to stay under harm. You know, I don't need to keep receiving hurt from that person. So I remove myself from harm's way. So you don't need to be in that place. But at the same time, I keep my heart clean towards that person. I don't hold any grudge, offense. God, you give me the capacity to forgive and to love. But I have moved myself from harm's way because I don't need to um, keep accepting hurt or harm. Now, whether that person changes, that's between that person and God. We can pray for them. Uh, if they give us opportunity, we can speak into their lives, or if somebody gives, or somebody else, whoever, somebody could speak into their lives, 
but their willingness to change is not in our control. The only thing that's in our control is our extending forgiveness and love. That's something in our control. So Luke 17, 3 and 4 says, just keep forgiving, just love. But it doesn't mean I need to, I need to tolerate their unrepentance or their, the evil they keep doing, right? We don't need to live under that. We can move ourselves out of that. I hope I answered your question, Chaya. If, uh, if you want to ask anything else, you can. Yes, Pastor. Thank you so much, Pastor. And Pastor, how we will keep away, like I didn't understand how we are going to keep us away from those things because we are continuously getting affected with those things. Mm -hmm. Even though we are uh, uh, just forgiving them and tolerating, but we don't see any change and it is affecting us back. <clears throat> So how we are going to deal with that situation? How we will keep us away from that kind of situation? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to, you know, uh, there's no one answer for every situation, but uh, we have to find something that's practical, right? So typical situation that we would encounter is in a, in a marriage relationship. Maybe one of the, you know, one of the partners, one of the, spouse, you know, the husband or the wife is very abusive. Uh, and the other person is on the receiving end of that abuse. Now, as a believer, it's okay. You forgive, keep your heart clean, just love the person because God still loves the person. But you don't have to keep receiving the harm that comes through that abuse, whatever form it is, physical or verbal or whatever. So then we would say, you know, practically what is possible? Maybe you can go and live in a different home, in a different place. And maybe maybe with another family member or move out to another place until this situation changes you know so we have to find what is practical what is doable in that situation just to protect the person you know otherwise this individual is going to be hurt in the long run because of the constant abuse so we say you go and live with you know go live separately live in a place where uh, you're safe um, uh, you know whatever's possible you know uh, and um, then let this other person who is abusive receive help so that he or she is able to change their ways, you know, change their behavior and realize that uh, they just can't keep hurting somebody else and expect everything. No, they've got to change their ways. They've got to receive help. And until that help, they show fruits of repentance. They show that, you know, they've come clear only then can that relationship be restored, right? So marriage is, you're not getting married to be abused. You're getting married to, to live a life uh, of peace and joy. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's the marriage covenant. And if that is not maintained, then obviously the covenant is being violated. And so then you need to protect whoever is being hurt in that relationship. Okay. Okay, Pastor. Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, Next one is Elisha. Uh, repentance and faith in Jesus Christ uh, is the foremost precondition for salvation. Yeah, so uh, repent and believe. So repent and faith, have faith in Jesus Christ is what you know will lead us into salvation. That's, a, that's the call to salvation, right? So we're saved by grace through faith. But that coming to faith is preceded by repentance, us turning towards God. Okay, I saw Sri Kumar's hand, and um, maybe somebody else also put up the hand. Please ask your questions. Thank you, Pastor. No, uh, I had a follow-up question, uh, what you discussed with Chaya. So anyway, you clarified it. I just wanted to know that how it work, work out uh, in a married couple, especially when the husband is more abusive and 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 the wife is just waiting and waiting and waiting mm. continuously for the man to change so in that condition or in the vice versa mm. uh, in that condition how how it can be practical uh, like uh, you know just like as you said every day you have to rip, you have to forgive and it will not how it can be practical but you clear, clear that thing thank you pastor thanks a lot thank you say please yes pastor just a clarification so the verse that was brought up about Jesus saying we should forgive seven times, 70 times. Can it also be explained in the light of um, Jesus wasn't really speaking literally that you have to count how many times we're basically saying have an open heart to forgive 
as many times as possible. But I also get your own part of the situation, depending on the situation, we need to take ourselves out if it's going to cause us harm. But as much as possible, what Jesus was basically saying is, forgive as many times as you can. Mm -hmm. Am I right to say that, sir? Yes, yes, you're right. Thank you, you're right. So we just have to keep our heart clean. That's some, that is something in our control. Uh, and that's what we can do. Um, and uh, the other person's change in behavior, repentance is something they have to work with God. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other questions? All right, so uh, this concludes the second section on repentance, recovery, and restoration. And so uh, keep this focus very clear. Um, there's the, you know, God has called us to holiness. He wants his holiness to be formed in us, established in us. And part of that holiness being worked in our lives in involves us uh, knowing and understanding the importance of repentance before God and, um, you know, being quick to repent and get right with God. So next week, as we mentioned, we will start off on the third section, which is overcoming. So practically, how do we live an overcoming life so we can walk in holiness? How do we, you know, deal with temptation and, uh, and uh, the flesh and the world and the devil? Uh, what are the things God has given to us um, to deal with these things. Okay. All right. Divya, you have a question? Um, or... Yes. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, I was just uh, thinking about repentance. Uh, it should be a daily discipline, right? In a, Is it like it should be a daily discipline in a person's life, in a believer's life? And also, uh, how can we help young children uh, to, you know, understand this or come to this point of the need for repentance how to make them understand mm -hmm. Thank you. so uh, in the believer's life yeah it's a daily thing uh, but when I, when we say daily uh, it doesn't mean that we just do it as a ritual uh, but every day we are conscious that if i do something that's out of alignment with god i need to get back Right. Now, there may be days where there's nothing wrong. I mean, you know, you've walked righteously before God. And yeah, so there's nothing to really repent of. But so you, you're not um, necessarily repenting of anything. But uh, there may be days when something goes wrong. And then you just say, God, I'm sorry. Right. That was wrong. And you get yourself back into God. So you're keeping short account. So the answer is yes. Every day we are conscious that if something goes wrong, and they quickly get back into the right place before God. For little children, uh, we can, one is we can speak to them, right? We can explain to them, all right, you see, uh, that's right. This is wrong. You did what was wrong. So what you need to do is say sorry. Right? You need to uh, either say sorry to whoever you wronged or sorry to God. And you need to, so we teach them that way. And sometimes we uh, let them also experience, I mean, this is, a, you know, depending on the situation, experience the, uh, the effect of, see, this is the right way. You didn't do it right, so here's a consequence. You know, something happened, which is not what you want. And so they understand that the best way is now get back in line. Yeah. So we teach them through simple life lessons, uh, you know, um, and especially in teachable moments. Uh, when something happens, that's the time to teach them, you know, and uh, show them that, okay, here's how you say sorry, and here's how you get back, you know. And once you say sorry, it's all good. So even as parents, uh, when they say sorry, we need to show what restoration looks like. That means we don't keep repeating that, you know, the, the mistake they made for the next two hours. No. The moment they say sorry, that means they've shown repentance. We need to let them experience restoration. Right? So they understand the whole process, repentance, recovery, restoration. They understand it 
in the simple life lessons and teachable moments. Uh, so, the, and as parents, we need to show them what it looks like, and then they will understand. Whether they value repentance, whether it's in towards the parents or that same thing, then applies in the relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, best. Okay. All right, uh, time's up. Nine fifty already. Uh, quickly, somebody could pray, and we'll dismiss, please. Anyone can pray. Can I pray? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, uh, wonderful opportunity, Lord, that you're teaching us, Father, all these things that we might have, uh, Lord, known but never have perceived it well, never have understood it well, Father, Lord. We thank you uh, for teaching us about uh, this uh, need for repentance, Father, Lord, and how it leads to our recovery and restoration, Father, Lord. Help us, uh, Father, be people who keep short accounts lord in our life as well as who, who are quick to repent lord who are who set boundaries lord who are vigilant lord who uh, keep uh, things transparent father lord um, you know, help us to keep ourselves humble lord before you we thank you and praise you father for um, what uh, we have learned we pray that you help us practice it in our lives father we bless pastor ashish and all the students here father lord uh, guide us lord and um, uh, teach us lord to walk in a deeper relationship with you all these things we pray in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen amen okay everyone enjoy the rest of your day enjoy your classes and thank you, uh, see you again thank you see you again next week uh, god bless you all thank um, you pastor thank you thank you pastor thank you thank you pastor thank you thank you god bless